the relationship between Muhammad and Aisha, that that's another controversial thing. And and I think I've I think I heard Mahmoud Hijab actually say it's abusing the fallacy of presentism, um, saying basically comparing Western ideas and, and lenses, like in your own words, actually, to the past and saying, well, how, you know, blaming somebody basically for, for values that was was commonplace. Although I'm not fully convinced by that because, and for anyone else, I would be, but the very, and I, and I really want your response to this because I, I, I find this to be, I haven't found a response to my uh, response, if that makes sense, yet. Provided Muhammad was divine and he is a prophet of God. Now, my standard would be, okay, if Muhammad is a prophet of God, if he is the prophet of God, I understand the, the, the presentism point. What doesn't rub me the right way is that he didn't know better or he didn't think, oh, well, maybe this isn't a great decision. Let's consummate the marriage when she's like 16 or something, you know, maybe this isn't a great idea. So I've had a few discussions about this topic and I think there are a few avenues to go through, which is, you know, for example, biology, like when, when do, when do women mature? Right? You know, all of this sort of thing. I guess that's what I'm trying to you know, ask you basically, what do you, what do you think of that? Do you, what do you think of my analysis of that? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole, I think the whole thing is a non-issue, and I, and let me try to explain this because when you when you look at the sunnah, meaning the life, the teachings, the actions, the ethics, the, and the principles of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace. From a scholastic perspective, you never reduce his sunnah, his way, to one incident, unless you only have one evidence for a particular issue. But when you look at the issue of marriage, the issue of age of consent, of consummation and stuff like this, there are far more evidences that you have to bring in to understand yeah. what is the prophetic way. It's actually really simple. And I think what we've done as Muslims, we've adopted the inaccurate or, or, or false epistemic assumptions. Let's just be very clear. In order for uh, uh, consummation to take place in the context of marriage, they have to be physically, there should be no harm. There's a general, it's called a usuli principle, a principle of jurisprudence. There is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. This includes psychological and physical. So I guarantee you, if there was any psychological, physical harm, it wouldn't have happened, whether she was 9, 10, 15, 55, or 150. Yeah, age is arbitrary. Age in this context is arbitrary because you have to apply the principle. So the thing is that there's no harm no psychological, no physical harm, which came out to be the case, by the way, because she was like responsible for one fourth of Islamic jurisprudence or something. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, there, there must be physical readiness, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a fact. Yeah. Number three, social acceptance. Yes. In Islamic jurisprudence, urf, urf means social kind of custom is determinative in Islamic law. This is a, again, usuli principle. It's a principle of Islamic law. Social custom is determinative, meaning it can formulate your ethical moral, moral, moral values. In that culture, she was, it wasn't going to affect her psychologically or physically. She was physically ready. She had spiritual mental readiness. And her father said, she's ready now. The community was a normal thing, right? Now, can you do that in this context? It will be immoral to do it in Britain. Why? Mm -hmm. Because let's apply the principles. Uh, is there any harm physically or emotionally? Is there biological readiness? And is there social acceptance? If you apply those three principles, then you get your moral value in Islam. So that's why someone says to me, would you allow your daughter to marry, uh, your, your nine year old daughter to marry uh, an older man? Like, no, because Islam teaches me these three more these three principles to apply in this context. Simple as that. Game over. And we can show in actual fact that when you apply those principles to Aisha radiallahu and I mean God be pleased with her, there was biological readiness, there was no physical or emotional harm, and there was social, social, social acceptance. And this, that's all evidence, not only based on Arab custom, based on European custom, my friend. A lot of Europeans married eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds. It's all in the legal documents, right? Even in, up to the 18th century, I believe, or 19th century. 
So it's a bit self-defeating when you have these Islamophobes saying, oh, Muhammad, blah, 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 this and that. I'm like, hold on a second. Man. You're shooting yourself in the foot. You know, all of your great-great-grandmothers, were, <laughs> you know, for you to be sure. here today is because of a whole. So for me, people have misunderstood the moral principles and the law of, of the legal system of Islam. It's, this, is, this is, by the way, not me making this up. This is what the usuli, the kind of uh, legal jurist, the legal, what's called, the... <laughs> Moral, moral legal philosophers or moral legal uh, sco scholars in the tradition, they have uh, derived these principles from the prophetic practice itself. So these three principles are either from the Quran or from prophetic practice. There is no harming, no reciprocating of harm. Uh, or social custom is determinative, obviously in certain context, there's a way to apply it. And obviously there needs to be physical readiness. Game over. It's just, there's nothing else. Obviously from our perspective, and that's where the anachronism comes into play. Our perspective is, and this is why it's really good because one day I, uh, my wife basically was asked this question. They asked her some, let me just use this language, it's getting a bit late now, so some <laughs> Muppet, yeah? All right. All <laughs> so right. Muppet came up to my wife and said, oh, you know, Muhammad, you know, slept with a nine-year-old or whatever. And then, uh, she turned around and said, um, or thank, he said, oh, oh, can you marry a nine-year-old? Or, or he married a nine-year-old. And he said, well, or he said something like, oh, was Aisha nine? And she was, she turned around and said, well, what age did you, do you want her to be? That stunned him. Because he was like, whatever age he gives is arbitrary. And, I, and, and for me, I'm going to be honest, authentic with you, that shows the profundity of the Islamic model. Because... Age of consent, for example, in the secular system, in one country, you're going to be a pedophile, man. Yes. Because yeah. it's, it's, it's madness. Like, in, I think in Spain, you get married at 12. In, in New York, if you've got permission of parents, it's 14. In some places, 21, 18. The point is, it's an arbitrary number. For us, the number is almost irrelevant. What's important is the principle. And if you apply these principles that I've just given you, bro, some 35 year olds are not fit to get married. Not fit to get married. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, like, like some me, people aren't, uh, you know, like like some people aren't uh, good to have kids or, or whatever. You know, there, yeah, there are certain sure. perimeters that that so that it's makes very apparent. Yeah, it's yeah. very principle based, and it's not arbitrary because when you always put a number to something, an arbitrary figure then you're going to end up with inconsistencies. And I think it's far more important to be principle-based. Is there that social acceptance? Does it, is there harm psychologically or physically? Is there biological readiness? These are really good principles to apply. And generally speaking, the average kind of number might be 19, 18, 17, 21, who knows? But it's, 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 it's specific, you know? And this is the moral legal reasoning of the Islamic tradition. So given that is the case, I don't even see this as a problem, man. Like, literally, I don't see it as a problem. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I definitely see what you mean in terms of there's more context to this, that there's there's principles to actually to look at here. I suppose for me, um, the, the consent thing is important. Um, like, to, to what level, you know, developmental stage can someone give consent? And I think that's more of a subjective question than, than, than people make it out to be. Um, because, it, you know, you could say consent of a 30 year old is, is, is imbalanced for example um somebody might not have, be in the right headspace to make that decision or or, yeah, for sure. or a function you know in, in a functional level not just in a um a, te a temporal one um, well, you should you should ask that question to the people who are you know ideological you know this whole ideological trans movement that you have eight-year-olds who have gender dysphoria yes and they think just by virtue of having gender dysphoria, they're allowed now to be on a journey to fundamentally do irreversible changes to the biology. Uh, you know, I don't see the people who've been complaining about the age of Aisha complaining about this. Yeah, we need to be consistent, right? For God's sake, they can't even vote. They can't even, you know, today's eight-year-old, by the way, yeah, maybe eight-year-olds a thousand years ago are different because the social context is different but the they would is, be more developed i'd imagine well yeah that biologically that has been the case as well they, they were more developed for yeah. sure because of the food the kind of environment uh, for sure but the, but the issue i'm trying to say here is you know 
this interesting issue of consent, it doesn't really come up much when it comes to these ideologues, right? Um, and, you know, I have my obviously, you know, position on this issue. I think it's, I think it's child abuse, frankly. I'm going to be honest, if someone's an eight-year-old and has gender dysphoria, you don't start them as an eight-year-old to start having irreversible biological changes to, 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 to who they are. They, they can't vote. They can't get married. They can't smoke. They can't drink. <laughs> I mean, like, mm. shocking. Like, I'm a parent. I'm thinking, this is, like, unbelievable. It doesn't make any sense to me. But the reason I'm mentioning it now is because it also goes to show the inconsistency of some ideologues. You know when ideologues point the finger about certain issues? Well, when you take the logical underlying basis of what they're saying, well, they should apply it to other aspects of the worldview and they will see that inconsistency, you know? But yeah, so it's not just about context. It's literally about legal reasoning and moral reasoning. This is the moral reasoning of Islam when it comes to these issues. No psychological or physical harm, biological readiness, social acceptance. When you apply that, you may get a range of ages for people across time. But in our context today, if someone said, oh, would you allow your nine-year-old daughter? I say, no, wait, because my nine-year-old daughter doesn't fulfill any of those criteria. Number one, there's no social acceptance. Uh, and that's determinative in this context. Number two, she's not physically or mentally fit. And she's probably not even biologically fit. So see you later, mate. Right? Do you see my point? Um, so when you apply it, you see the non-arbitrary nature of the Islamic tradition. And yes, you could argue it, it can be misapplied. But that happens because you don't have good political structures in place. Yeah. It happens because you don't have accountability. Just like in our culture, in the UK, law could be misapplied. You know? And yeah. look at lobbying groups, right? You know, we claim, you know, the developing world is full of uh, corruption. But there's a lot of corruption in our country, but it's as hidden as lobbying and financial transactions and we saw this with the covid crisis right some guy giving some person a contract he has never dealt in this domain of business of medical uh, um, uh, what do you call it products before and you're giving him this massive contract i mean come on man so you know we're human beings man we're gonna make errors and yeah and i would speak out against it as well if it doesn't hasn't followed those principles and there's no that right accountability that would be Abuse, for sure, 100%, because if they're not physically fit, not mentally, psychologically avail uh, ready, and there's no so kind of, you know, that kind of orf, that social custom, then, yeah, that would be deemed as immoral in Islam. You've given me a lot of food for thought. Um, I, I find, like in your book, it, it feels like this process has been duplicated in the sense that what you've been saying, I definitely understand your justifications and your, the, the, the way that, you're seeing things I can get behind. And, and for that reason, I need to think more about it because you've given me a lot to consider uh, and to reconsider.